stand with me. First Samuel chapter 1. Let's go to verse 2. King, talking about Elkanah. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other, Penina. Penina. How do you say that? Penina. I'm Jamaican. I pronounce a hard I. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man, Elkanah, used to go up year by year from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. It's going to get me. It's okay. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. Though the Lord had closed her womb, her rival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her, but because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Let's jump down to verse 9. After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Jump down to verse 12. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Yeah. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, or her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord. I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Verse 17, then Eli answered, go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you've made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was no longer sad. Oh they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. Yeah. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Oh. Heavenly Father, we are standing in the need of prayer. We're here today to receive from you, and thus far you have been moving. Yes, Lord. Right now I ask that your Holy Spirit will intensify. In the name of Jesus. Cover me under the blood. Hide me in the cleft of the rock. Yes. I submit my lips to you. I submit my heart to you. Use me as you would have it go. I pray today, God, that the words of life, as they go forth, will hit the, the target and reproduce today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord God. For a few moments, I just want to encourage your heart on the theme, the impossible is possible. All right. The impossible is possible. If you look at our history, society has seemed to be infatuated with the impossible. Just take a quick peek down the African American history road, and you will see that millions of men, women, and children were captured and taken to this country from Africa. And in that time, them imagining their freedom, the thought was that it's simply not possible. Yet, it happened. Right. Those same ancestors, the thought of them, of their own um, children and their children's children, attending a college and becoming a professional, even at the time this country put in writing that our ancestors were actually three-fifths of a person. Okay. The thought 
of their ancestors becoming professionals and going to college was, that's not possible. Yes, but then there came Cheney, and then there came Howard, and then there came Hampton, and then there was the Virginia Union. Union. Guess what? It happened. Yeah. I'm kept catching up on my history. So. All right, all right. <laughs> when the Wright brothers decided that they wanted to build a plane, folks on the sidelines said, what? People in flying machines? That's simply impossible. Yet, it happened. Yeah. Neil Armstrong, the first American man to walk on the moon, and even in the super bad hidden figures. Can you all watch it? Just imagine inside that room, the thought on everyone's mind was, mm -mm, it's not going to happen. It's impossible. Yet, it happened. Check out Wilma Rudolph. She was born with polio and could only walk with the use of braces on her legs. One day she told the doctors, I want to be an Olympic champion. The doctor said to her, honey, it's impossible. But in 1960, guess what? It happened. Are right, you like this one? When Barack Hussein Obama decided to run as a black man, in 2008 for the president of these United States. Many of us, even in this room today, oh not looking at anybody, <laughs> many of us thought, uh -uh, not in this lifetime. It's simply impossible. But guess what? It happened. And the last one, the thought of number 45. Becoming the president and winning out over a former Secretary of State. Many of us, including myself, thought, uh-uh, it's impossible. Yet, it happened. But even in the church, the thought of a woman standing behind a sacred desk to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, everybody and their grandmother thought, it's impossible. Yet, yet, minister, it happened. Amen. Well, so for many of us, impossibility stands as the great wall between you and your destiny. These obstacles that we face it can cause us to lose sight of God's promise for our lives because we don't have the faith to see that the impossible is really possible. And even the most spiritual of us, the tongue-talking, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost folk, we got to be honest about some stuff. Because life will cause our faith to falter. Let me say that again. Yeah. Life will cause our faith, faith to falter. Right. Right. No matter who you are, yeah. no matter where you come from, no matter your degrees, your position, if you're a baby in Christ or you're a seasoned saint, you are not exempt from impossible situations. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's get real. You know that feeling when you have a desire in your heart, you're longing for God to move on something in your life, uh -huh. and what happens? Nothing. No movement. No progression. Just silence. Well. And then you get to the point, Pastor, where you decide that Maybe this promise over my life was a figment of my imagination. Now that's where we find our girl Hannah. Well, yeah. In the text, she's facing an impossible situation. Now although her husband loved her and even favored her, she could not receive it because of her circumstances. Well, One, she was living as a barren woman. And in that time, that was an unbearable fact of life. Right. But it, ma it made matters worse because Hannah was a bystander of her society. Her husband mm, had another wife mm, with whom he would consummate his marriage and to throw salt in the womb. That other wife had multiple offspring. Right. Mm. Now put yourself in hand kind of shoes for a moment. So just imagine, you and your husband, you're living with him, right? 
And then he takes another life. To live with him also. His wife has children. And every single day, she heckles you. Now, I don't know about you, <laughs> but that sounds like an impossible situation to deal with. You see, in life, you'll be faced with impossible situations and even unsurmountable odds that will stretch you beyond your perceived faith capacity. Yeah. In those times, church, you you got to remember that your relationship with God is it needs a persistent faith. Yes, yeah, that's right. And his promise over your life can overcome any obstacle that confronts you yes, yes. and will lead you into life's purpose and destiny. Yes. Now, I don't have a lot of time, so let's just really deep dive into this real quickly. I got a question. I, I think the text can answer and actually help us answer it. So, what can you expect when facing life's impossible situation? Come on. What can you expect when you're facing life's impossible situation? The first thing that we need to look at. <laughs> the first thing that we need to look at, brothers and sisters, is that you can expect your enemies. To augment the severity of your situation. Oh, yeah. well, that's what they do. That's what they do. You see, let's go on verse 6. Let's see what it says. Her rival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, and as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, Penina used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah would weep and she wouldn't eat. Hannah was troubled. Because she was actually in an unfair fight. That's right. She was battling two different enemies. Mm -hmm. The first enemy was the very present nemesis who just so happened to live in her house. Oh, Everywhere Hannah went, there was Petty Penina. Mm -hmm. Right there. Oh, and notice in the text that Hannah didn't even, she couldn't even go to church. Without seeing Petty P. <laughs> Petty P was up in her face all the time. And so this vexed Hannah emotionally. Right. Mm -hmm. Now I would venture to say in the house right now that some of you are dealing with Petty Peninas in your life. Oh You're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to stay the course. But there's one or two folks standing in the way between you and jail time. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but the text. It's going to help us today. It's going to help us understand that you will face petty benignas in life. You will face petty benignas of the world. Because your enemies are placed in your life to position your focus. Not on your, well, they're, they're positioned in your life to focus you on your failures and not focus you on the Heavenly Father. So they're placed in your life as a distraction from the Father. Now, I don't know about you, but I know I needed to hear that today. Yeah, that really was for me. My God. When God dropped this in my spirit, Pastor, I was like, oh my God. Yeah. It was so good. Yes, yes. Now, what, what, what he does is he lets folks come into your life to mess with you. So you focus on how you failed instead of the Father. Now, your enemies will rise up and speak against your very existence. They will intentionally amplify those vulnerable places in your life. You don't deserve that title. You shouldn't have that promotion. You haven't done this before. You're not really that qualified or experienced. Matter of fact, you're actually not what we're looking for. And that's actually cold word for, girl, your melody and ministry is just too much to handle. Mm. Don't miss this church. The enemy is committed to using whatever it takes to steer you away from the path that God has placed on you. But I want, to I want you to realize something. As soon as people begin to tell me what I can and cannot do, as soon as people begin to say who I am and who I'm not, I'm in the right place at the right time. And I'm actually at the point and at the position to see what God has for me. Yeah, yeah. So nothing like that can deter me. Yeah. You see, don't miss your shot this morning. Yeah. Because every naysayer, every hater, yeah. every racist, yeah. every person that yeah. abused me, yeah. every one of them yeah. cannot come. 
between me and my purpose. Yeah. 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 Now, the only way, how do you deal with petty P? How do you deal with petty deniers? Right. Persistence. Come on now. Persistent faith, mm -hmm. persistent dreams, yeah. persistent visions, persistent fasting, persistent prayer, persistent yeah. worship. Yes. How do you think our ancestors got through Jim Crow? Yes. How do you think they got through Bull Connor and the White Sixers? Yes. 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 Persistent prayer, persistent faith, persistent dreams, persistent vision, persistent fasting, persistent worship. Yes. They were persistent. Yes. And the only way to answer pettiness is with persistence. Yes. 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 Get this. Yeah. You have what it takes. To stand up in the face of your enemy. Amen, amen. You see, life's gonna come at you like a fifth grade bully. <laughs> you're gonna be prodded, you're gonna be pushed, and it will even make you believe that God, the God that lives in you, doesn't give you enough power to live. But child of God, you stand up in the face of your enemies. You tell them, I see you, girl. I see you. Yeah, I can do that. I'm a girl. I see you, petty P. But I got something for you. I got the remedy for your pettiness. Persistent pray, persistent faith, persistent dream, persistent vision, persistent worship. That's the position to be in. To be persistent in the face of your adversary. Be persistent. There's no weapon. The weapons will form, my God, but they will not prosper because I'm persistent. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because I'm per persistent. Nothing can separate me from the love of God because I'm persistent. Go back to Hannah. Hmm. Hannah's first battle was, of course, with Petty Penina. But the second battle was with herself. Hmm. I'm still in the text, and she was preoccupied with her circumstance in the torment of her enemy, and it robbed her of her own nourishment to live. She kept crying, she wasn't eating. And this was a vicious cycle. And sometimes we find this even in the body of Christ. And if we're not careful, the words of the enemy that they speak against you will take control over you because of the dialogue that is inside of you. Can I just repeat that? I think we really need to get this. Say it again. Okay? It says, if we're not careful, the words that the enemy speaks can take control over you because of the dialogue that happens within you, right? No, I didn't, I didn't read everything. Can I just go back? If we're not careful, the words of the enemy that they speak against you, that's what I missed out, will take control over you because of the dialogue that happens within you. So it takes root inside of you and begins to grow. Now, if you're not, um, maybe I'm not qualified. These are the words of the enemy. Maybe I'm not good enough. Am I really effective? Maybe I'm not a good parent. Maybe I'm not a good spouse. And maybe I'm not a good church member. These are the small seeds that the enemy will try to speak over you so it can be implanted within you. And then, it begins to bear fruit when we begin to say it. Um, amen. But we're going to be persistent yes. in speaking God's word yes. over our life. Amen. 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 You see, the thing is, we're already fighting an enemy that we cannot control. And so we have to stop fighting the enemy that we can control. Yes. Life's going to back you up in corners. Yes. There will be disease, there will be discourse, there will be depression. There might even be some doubt. But when you start doubting, just start thinking about the source of your strength. Yeah. 
to start thinking about who has met your needs and think about the one you've committed your life to serve. Yeah. Your enemies will amplify the severity of your situation, but we are going to be persistent. Yeah. So not only will they do that, but when you're facing life's impossible situations, you must expect others to misunderstand persistent praise and persistent prayer. Let's go to verse 9. Are you still with me? Yes. Yes. Now after they had eaten and drunk a child, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the side before the doorpost of the temple. She, Hannah, was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Let's go down to verse 13. Hannah prayed silently, and her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Mm -hmm. And Eli thought she was drunk. Yeah. So at this moment, Hannah is vexed in the tent. Mm -hmm. Because for years she's been tormented, and she's lived a life with a host of unanswered prayers. She did a religious duty. She went to church, she prayed to God, she taught Sunday school, she tied her first fruits, she even paid her quarter in $100 donation. But still no baby. And no relief from Petty P. Hannah at this point is so desperate that she literally positioned herself in the only place she knew God would meet her. Mm. Now let me stop right here. Because when you're facing the impossible and you decide to trust God's will, yeah. even when it don't look like it's going to turn out the way you want it, there's going to be folks that have, they're going to say some crazy things, but your position matters. Yeah. Yeah. You see, Hannah knew that she needed something from God. And so Hannah knew did the other thing she knew to do. She was persistent with standing up and, and, and not trying to allow Pennypanina to get in her head. But the next thing she did was when she had a chance to go to church, she didn't come up with no lame excuse. She didn't say, oh, my back hurts. Oh, my foot hurts. Oh, I'm so tired. But what Hannah did was Hannah went to the temple and took the opportunity Kill 
Thank <laughs> you. 